Hi, this is Kevin. I'm uh, presenting my 30-year war armies. Uh, this time, uh, the 30-year conflict uh, with my Swedish-German uh, Protestant army. I don't need to tell you much about this war, except that it left 8 million dead. 6,000 castles destroyed, 50,000 villages burned, one-third of all the cities of Central Europe destroyed, a quarter of the population dead, and total devastation. Uh, devastation caused by, by a couple of points that I'll bring up uh, in a few minutes, but it's with heavy heart I present these armies as I lived in Germany for a good portion of my life, and I st still see the effects of this struggle that it's had on the psyche of Germany and its peoples. When trying to go into detail on this conflict will take hours, but uh, Europe, uh, Holy Roman Empire was starting to fragment under religious pressures. France wanted more territory, so did Poland. The Vatican wanted to keep control. You had your German princes that were fighting for more control and religious freedom, and then you had the insurgents of Denmark, the United Netherlands, and Sweden all vying for power. So, boiling it down, you have the origins. Religious, so Protestant versus Catholic. You had power, the struggle for succession of the Holy Roman Empire. And then you had a dynastic, the Habsburgs, the Austrians, and the Spanish fighting against the uh, princes of Germany. So the origins lie in religious and cultural and geopolitical. And when those three came together, they caused a war of the, of the century. It was monumental. So the German princes wanted to gain autonomy from the Holy Roman Empire. France wanted to limit the Habsburg power. Spain wanted the power in Germany to grow. And there you have it. It was a powder keg. But if you look at this, you can see the Holy Roman Empire. They're different uh, dukes and princes. Uh, some were Catholic, some were Lutheran, and some were Calvinistic. And they wanted to live that way. Well, the Imperial Roman Emperor had a different idea of what he wanted for his subjects. There were four phases of the Thirty Year War. There was the first, which was very local and religious in nature. Uh, the Imperial uh, armies trying to quell the rebellions and gain control. That was the Bohemian phase at first and the Danish phase that was then followed by the Swedish and the French phase, which were much more continental, wide-sweeping, and very, very political. But let's jump off now into the armies of the Swedes and the Germans, and uh, the armies that uh, the Protestant movement felt was their savior on continental Europe. At the heart of the Swedish and German armies was... King Gustav II Adolfs. He uh, was an amazing general. He's counted as one of the top ten that the world has ever seen. Um, he uh, was a, a, a leader that revolutionized how we went to war, and I would say he's the father of combined arms uh, for the day. And it's only befitting that uh, I play the song now that really reflects uh, the line of the north, and his army sang it, always before going into battle. So the song that they sang was Ein Fest a Burg ist unser Gott by Martin Luther. And so you can imagine that army is singing this before going into battle at Lützen or at Breitenfeld. It was an army that was deeply uh, at its core religious and fought for this particular cause. But behind the scenes, of course, was their ambition for land, territory, and prestigiousness. But most of these uh, uh, soldiers that fought in these armies, both Swedes, Saxons, Germans, Danes, Scots, English, Poles, they came from all over the known world uh, to fight for the line of the north in the Protestant army that was going to crumble the imperial Habsburg dynasty. 
So you can see the army that I have here is quite large and I think it, it uh, <clears throat> helps if I explain a little bit about what uh, Gustav uh, Adolphus created. You know, Gustav, uh, he created what, uh, if I get it right, uh, the Swedish system, which was a Swedish brigade. So it was a tactic that he perfected that was more of a higher concentration of firepower by creating linear battle lines. And he used it very successfully against enemy formations. His idea was to, to make a thinner battle line with not so much pike, but much more uh, the linear and based on firepower. All of the conscripts that had any substance or that were, were exceptional went into the musketeer group and not, not the pike. So he, 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 he really tipped the, the balance in his favor uh, with firepower. So when they came to blows in Malay, I would say that they were uh, at a disadvantage, but you had to get there first. So the, uh, uh, one of the, the biggest advantages of the Swedish were they had smaller guns that they brought up into the linear formations. Uh, didn't rely so much on, on heavy artillery that were in emplacements, but created more of a mobile structure. And uh, put these mobile artilleries in massed batteries or for the most part, they were baked into the formation of, of, the, of, of the infantry regiments. He also, uh, with his cavalry, moved away from the typical uh, tactic of the time, which was to charge up a caracol, fire your pistol. The first line would retreat behind the second line and, and repeat. Uh, Gustav uh, felt that the cavalry was there to charge and charge directly into into the line with cold steel. They were a shock cavalry. And one of his uh, uh, famous units uh, were of course his Finnish uh, cavalry. They were particularly ferocious. And um, that was his strength. Mobility of this cavalry, the agility of his artillery, and his firepower of his linear regiments, and all of those working together. Uh, that, was, that was important, and that's what Gustav Adolphus brought to the field. He was able to successfully push and beat back the imperial armies of, uh, time and time again. Of course, at the Battle of of uh, Lutzen, that was a massive struggle between the two. Uh, when the imperial armies were allowed to come to blows, it uh, was devastating. But you can see here from my armies, I've tried to replicate some of the famous Swedish regiments. Uh, the Yellow Regiment, the Blue Regiment, and uh, you'll see I have a small block of pike uh, with a linear formation of heavy firepower on, this, on the sides and smaller mobile guns uh, in front of the unit or on the flanks. Um, that is the Swedish uh, Red Regiment. And uh, I've mixed, uh, the Swedes are in the center of the, of the uh, formations here and then the, the German forces, German armies and uh, their mercenaries are, are in formations, as you see behind on the hills. Uh, they're not in battle formation as they would be at uh, any of the major conflicts. I just put them out here for show uh, to let you see the painting style, the flags, how they were organized. But I think that, that uh, this army that's created here can be put on any 30 year war battlefield and be able to represent quite nicely any of the conflicts that had occurred. You know, the Swedish army at the time was generally uh, outnumbered uh, on the battlefield. However, its uh, quality of its leadership, the quality of its troops, uh, I would say that a Swedish army was rarely outgunned. Um, 
It has the ability to field large numbers of, of light artillery pieces, infantry support, um, and has uh, what was called a Swedish salvo. Um, quite devastating and uh, uh, would stop an imperial tercio oftentimes in its tracks. But uh, uh, coming to, to, to physical blows was always a difficult thing and uh, they would wield under that pressure. Uh, so I hope that you've uh, enjoyed at least the pictures that I've taken and its representation of, uh, of this army. I've enjoyed putting it out here. And uh, I, um, if you have any comments or anything to say, I didn't want to go too depth into the history. I could talk for hours. But I think that um, you can see how I painted it, that it uh, reflected in my mind what this army would have looked like. So the next army up is the Imperial Catholics.